what I'm what I'm going to start doing today is I will pause a bit and, and go back into what we presented yesterday. Uh, because I feel that the materials that I presented, I mean, it may be a bit, uh, a, lo a lot of materials and a lot of information to process. Uh, so please uh, give me feedback in order for me to understand uh, how you're doing, how you're coping with the materials we are presenting. But in any case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to take a step back and, and go a bit through a, a bit of an R script um, to illustrate some of the methods I spoke about yesterday uh, before uh, later today. So that will not take long time because in any case, this is a, a part of a computer lab that you can do it uh, at your own time. It's just that uh, I'm going to take a bit of a step back and go through some of the uh, practical things uh, by sharing my R screen with you um, <clears throat> in order for you to uh, maybe connect uh, the notation and the model, uh, the Feyerot model to some practice. So we'll take a bit of time doing that and then I will continue with extending the area level model in a couple of directions. One is to use a, uh, a transformations and this I think uh, will be relevant in your case because for example, transformations can be useful when you are estimating proportions uh, and then you're using area level models. And, and that might be relevant in, in the case of Dana because um, if we look at poverty mapping, normally uh, what we want to estimate is some kind of, uh, in the simplest case, a proportion of, uh, of, of, of households, say, or individuals below the poverty line. Uh, so that I think relates to one of the questions that Jose asked last uh, time, uh, last week. Uh, he said, I think, um, he asked me whether uh, the area level models could be applied to proportions and uh, the answer is yes, they can be applied. So, and then uh, the other extension, which is not, might not be immediately relevant, but it might become relevant at some point for Dane is where we are using in the model uh, covariate information. So remember that the covariate information is denoted by X. Uh, these X's are assumed to be population level data and hence under the standard Feyerot model, we assume uh, that uh, these covariates are measured without error. However, in some cases, especially if you have multiple sources of data, uh, some covariates may be coming from, uh, from data sources that are measured with error. Uh, for example, think of a situation uh, where you want to include covariate information uh, uh, and you want to include such covariate information that is updated quite frequently, right? You don't want to rely so much on census data that may be happening uh, at um, big time gaps between the in the intercensal period uh, and in terms you are trying to bring information from some other source uh, that is updated more frequently and, and for example a source of that kind can be a much bigger survey that collects um, uh, information uh, on some of the covariates of interest but this now is associated with error okay so if you want to account for that error then the Feyerot model, the area level model, needs to be extended in order to recognize the fact, the fact that some covariates may be measured with error. Okay, and that's quite a nice framework because it can combine information both from um, both from census, uh, but also uh, admin and also uh, survey data in this case. So you could com combine covariate information from multiple uh, from multiple data sources. OK, so let me just start by sharing my screen. OK, uh, can you please, uh, someone uh, uh, um, uh, let me know if uh, my R screen is vi is visible to you? Is that possible? Can you let me know if you can see my R, my R uh, studio screen? Yes, we yeah, are it's seeing. It's visible. Yeah, thank you. OK, so what 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 is uh, so this is an R studio screen, OK? And hopefully, uh, what uh, you, you may be familiar with are, are, are you our users? Can you let me know if you are users? Are you have you seen R before, or is that new to you? I have seen before. I, I think that I demand my some of my data wrongly, data processes of my master thesis in R Studio, 
But in, in Danny, I mostly I am mostly a SATA and SATA user. What are you using in Danny, Jose? Sorry, uh, sorry. Can you repeat that? Uh, in uh, what software do you use? Okay, Stata. Okay. Um, I, I, I will, I will, I mean, at least experimentally when you run things, uh, I think R will be m most he helpful for you. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Stata has some functionality in terms of smaller estimation, but not all of the tools uh, that we're going to use here are in, in Stata. So I would recommend that uh, uh, R uh, ideally is the environment to use at least for producing some estimates uh, of small area uh, uh, that you're interested in. So. What we do here, so we, we have written computer labs where you can go into detail, both uh, assuming that people have used R before or some colleagues may have not used R before. OK, so don't worry too much about it. The aim of what I'm doing here is to try to link a bit theory to practice. OK, so that's what I'm aiming to do here. So uh, I'm going to load first some libraries. Uh, libraries, remember in R, the libraries are basically uh, specialized software packages that run through R, okay, that we load because we want to do specific um, operations, specific, specific statistical computation, okay. Uh, so this this is the, uh, the li these are the libraries that I'm going to use here. The most important library for now is this library EMDI, okay. Remember that uh, EMDI is the main software we will be using here. And remember that for area level models, you will see that I have given you a, a paper uh, that describes the small area estimation based on area level models with R, okay? And all of this is based with, on, on EMDI, okay? And EMDI obviously implements a, a small area estimation with unit level models with particular emphasis on poverty mapping. Okay, so this, these are my libraries. Uh, I'm setting a, a working directory. The working directory is the place where you store uh, files uh, that you are interested in using as part of your computation. So it may be data files, it may be a shape file, it may be uh, other other files that you, you, you really need to use as, uh, when you do your operations with R, okay? So you can set your working directory uh, using command set WT, so, so that means set working directory, uh, and you can do it, you can set it in your preferred directory, okay? So, uh, okay, so here is uh, where I do some data manipulations. Remember that uh, for this example, the data set comes as part of package EMDI, okay? So you can you can use this um, script uh, at your own time to uh, implement to to get to get to used to the idea of using EMDI for the purposes of estimating and fitting area level models, okay? So this is my combined data set which is part of EMDI, okay? I'm going to run this command. And you will see here that you, the, the combined data, why is it combined? Because in order to fit a fake Heriot model, we need two sources of data. We need our sample data, okay? And we need our population data, okay? So the sample data is what you have from your survey, and that will include the direct estimates uh, of your parameter, your target parameter that might be, for example, as we do here, the mean equivalized income, or it may be a proportion a, a, a direct estimate, a direct estimate of the proportion of uh, households below a poverty threshold. The population data will include those explanatory variables that hopefully will help you to predict and uh, um, your direct estimates, whether that is the proportion or the mean uh, of what you're interested in modeling, okay? And we attach uh, the data set, uh, the combined data set in R so that we can do the operations, okay? So what I want to do is I want to show you how this data set looks like, right? Remember that this is an area level data set. And as I said yesterday, the area level data set has what each line of that data set corresponds to uh, one area, okay? So for example, if in uh, in, Dan, in in Colombia you have say 1,100 uh, municipalities and uh, then uh, ideally you will have, if you had samples from all municipalities, the rows of that data set will be 1,100 and the columns will be equal to how many explanatory variables you have plus the direct estimates for those municipalities that are in your sample, plus 
the variances of these direct estimates. Okay, so this is all you need in order to be able to estimate the fake headers model. Okay, so I'm going to output here uh, the first three, uh, the first six lines. Okay. And I'm going to scroll up a bit. I hope you, that this is visible, but I'm going to scroll up a bit so that you, you can see what this includes, okay? So the first column is called domain, and you see that this is the name of um, the area, in this case, in the data set in Austria. And each row corresponds to one area. So you see row one uh, is... Uh, uh, corresponds to this area called uh, Amstetten, area two is Baden, and so on, okay? That's the first column. The second column is called mean. That's the direct estimates of the average equivalized income that is estimated using formulae that Angela presented in, 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 in session uh, one, in part one of the course last week. And so these are direct estimates of the mean equivalized income using the survey data uh, in this case, we use EU silk data. In your case, it will be something like the high access survey. Uh, and then uh, and then the other thing that we have here, I'm going to this column here called var min. That column is the are the estimated variances of the direct. OK, so you need to estimate your point estimates to get estimates of your point estimates using your survey data and estimates of the direct uh, of the variances of the direct estimates also using your survey data. OK, so these are two important things. And then there are a set of covariates in here. For example, in this example, we will be using the CAS available. Uh, we will be using the um, self-employed variable and we will be using also some other variables to model the direct means of the equivalized uh, income. OK, there are other variables there, but for now, let's focus on, on, on some simple variables. OK, so I want you to think about it. So it's it's a very easy data set to construct. You take your survey data, you estimate two things. You estimate your uh, direct test, you obtain your direct estimates, you obtain the variances of the direct estimates, and then you have also a column uh, that identifies the names of the areas or the geographical codes, depending on what is available in your data set. And then you need another data set, which is the population data that will give you information about population level covariates for each of the areas that are available in your sample data. OK, uh, and then also you need in the population data, you need also the geographical identifier because you have to merge these two data sets and uh, the merging will happen uh, uh, according to the domain identifier. So both data sets have to be able, you have to be able to link the population data and the sample data that corresponds to the same area, okay? Once you have that, okay, then you are ready to go, okay? And the first model I presented here is a Faye Heriot model, so I'll call it Faye Heriot 1. This name can be anything, right? You can name it as, as you wish. So what comes on the left hand side is just the name of the object where the results are going to be stored. Uh, and uh, the, on, the, on the right hand side, uh, we have to use command FH, which called, stands for Faye Heriot. Uh, the structure of the R command is quite simple. What you do is you say, I want to model. Look, I'm highlighting it here. Hopefully you will be able to see it. I want to model my um, mean, okay, the fixed part of the model, uh, I'm modeling the mean, the direct estimates of the average equivalized income, okay, as a function of, in this case, uh, four covariates, okay, CAS, no, three covariates, CAS, self-employed status, and unemployed benefit status, okay, so it's a very simple model, I have my direct estimates on the left hand side and I have three covariates uh, on the on the right hand side. What else do I need to specify in the Faye Heriot model? I need to specify the, the variances of the direct. Remember, the variance of the direct is what I denoted in my slides as sigma squared EI, right? And because we only have area level data under the Faye Heriot model, we assume that sigma squared EI is fixed. OK, so uh, you have to specify this and this is given by var underscore mean in this example. So this is where the estimated variances of the direct 
uh, are saved. You need to specify the, the, the combined data, so the name of where the combined data is saved. You need to specify the domain identifier so that R knows what are you trying to estimate, what are the areas that you are trying to get estimates for. Method, you can specify or you can leave it unspecified. Uh, there's always a default method. And then here you specify whether you want mean squared error estimates. Uh, here we are putting this as false at this point because at the moment I have three covariates and I want to find the best model with these three covariates. OK, once I find my best model, then I'm going to turn mean squared error estimation into true and I will ask uh, R to EMDI to to also estimate, give me estimates of the mean square error. Okay, so what I do is I highlight this and I'm going to run it. Okay, and that's very quick to run. It's not a very complex model, right? And what I do here is I specify the step function. As, as I mentioned yesterday, the step function is something that allows you autom automatically to select uh, the best combination of, var of variables, of explanatory variables, according to some criteria. And here the criteria that I specified is the Akaiki information criterion, but uh, the software allows you to specify other types of criteria as well. Okay, this step function will be particularly useful if you work with a very, very large number of covariates. Okay, so think of covariates that come, for example, from geospatial data, and we have an example of that kind of thing, um, this kind of data later. This will become extremely, you know, if you will have maybe hundreds of variables and maybe using a step function might be something that will help you to manage the model selection. So if I run step, the step function, R will do go through calculations and it will produce you results uh, for um, uh, for the, um, uh, the how you how the model is selected. So you see that uh, it will go through an iterative process. You see in step one, uh, you get the minimum uh, AIC when you remove the unemployment benefit uh, variable. So in the second step, this variable is removed. And then uh, you assess the model with only two variables, uh, i.e. with the variables cast and self-employed. You see that the minimum uh, AIC is obtained where none, none of these variables is removed. And so the final specification is one that includes the CAS and self-employed variables into the model. OK, and then what I do here is I'm re-estimating the Fay Harriot model, but now including only the two variables that have been identified as important for predicting uh, the average equivalent income in uh, areas in Austria. OK, and this time I also specify the MSA to be true. And that will give me, uh, and I want to uh, estimate the mean square terror using an analytical mean square terror according to Prasad Rouse, which is the one that we described in the in the course yesterday, right? So if I run this, again, that's quite quick because uh, I'm using just an analytical mean square terror estimator, which is quite um, straightforward to calculate as part of the software. And then I'm using the summary function of the object in order to get the results. OK, and you will see here that uh, first of all, EMDI will inform you about how many in sample areas you have. In this case, we have 94 areas that are present in our survey data, in our ground truth data and zero areas that are out of sample. If you had out of sample areas, still EMDI will allow you to perform estimation, but it will inform you about how many out of sample areas you have. It informs you about the estimated variance component. That's, that, that value here corresponds to the notation is equal to sigma squared u. This is the between area variability. It informs me about the method that is, is being used to estimate the mean square error. Uh, as I mentioned here, we have specified uh, the analytical type mean square error. We use a Prasad draw estimator. OK. Then it will give you the estimates of the, the coefficients of the of the fixed part of the model. That looks exactly the same as any standard regression output. Remember that these coefficients correspond to the betas in your lecture notes. Okay, so make a note of that. 
So you have an intercept estimate, an estimate for the variable cars, and an estimate for the variable self-employed with corresponding standard errors and so on in p-values. Then you get some explanatory measures as well, okay? And then uh, you get some residual diagnostics um, informing you about the skewness and the ketosis of uh, your level one residuals, the sampling errors, and the, uh, the, the, the random effects as well. Because remember that we are assuming normality for these uh, errors, okay? Uh, what then you can do is you can use a plot command if you want to plot your um, uh, your estimates of, um, if you want to plot the residual diagnostics, and we have the plots in the lecture uh, notes uh, that we, uh, we, we covered yesterday. And you have also another command called compare underscore plot. Okay, and I'm just going to run this for a moment and you will see what happens. So you see that here, Hopefully that is, you can see that. Is, is it, can you see it? Uh, is, is it uh, visible, the plot? Um, maybe someone can guide me, maybe Jose or Paula. Paula? Yes, it is, we, we are seeing. Because I'm, 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 I'm moving between screens and uh, you know, I'm, I'm worried a bit. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So you can see that what, what it plots here is uh, the model-based estimates against the direct estimates. And ideally, you want these two lines to be as close as possible. They will not be the same, because remember that the model-based estimates use a, a convex combination between the direct and the synthetic, OK? But uh, hopefully, these two will be quite close, OK? So that's one of the plots that is being used here. Uh, let me close this and go back to uh, my R session and press enter, and that will give you another plot. Uh, and this basically plot uh, is, uh, it plots the direct estimates um, against the model-based estimates now, where uh, the, the, the domains are ordered by decreasing mean squared error, okay? So you see that uh, on the left-hand side of the plot, you can see quite a big difference between the direct and the model-based estimates. But as we move to the right-hand side of the plot, uh, then clearly uh, the uh, the model base and the direct estimates, the mean squared errors and the variances are very, very close, okay? So that's another plot you get as a result of uh, this. And then I can move a bit more and show you this plot here, which is basically telling you how uh, the direct estimates convert against the, the model based estimates by using box plots. And here you can see that um, uh, how th these two are compared effectively. And th th this is the, 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 the uh, horizontal axis here is the coefficient of variation. So you see that overall, uh, the, the median coefficient of variation of the model based estimates is smaller than the median esti estimate of the variance of the direct estimate. So you see here that this is a plot that il indicates that in terms of uh, gains in coefficients of variation, it seems that using the model provides you some efficiency gains. In other words, your coefficients of variation seems to be lower on average compared of the model-based estimates seem to be lower on average compared to the estimated coefficients of variation of the direct estimates. Okay, so that compare plot command is quite useful in terms of uh, illustrating uh, the uh, the uh, the comparison between direct and model-based estimates. And the final thing I wanted to show is basically a, a, some um, using the command estimators, you get the actual point estimates under the fair Heriot model and the direct point estimates with associated variances of the direct and estimated mean squared errors of uh, the model-based estimates, okay? So I'm just going to output here a few lines. So what you get as a result of this is effectively uh, the uh, the first column will be the domain. So for each of the areas in your data set, you get a, a column with the direct point estimates, in this case of equivalized income. You get the uh, direct variance, okay? Then you get the Faye Heriot point estimates, uh, that these are the model-based estimates. Uh, the, the ones that are under column FH will give you the model-based estimates. And then the final column FH MSC 
it will give you the analytical estimate of the mean squared error, which in this case is the Prasad Rao estimator. Okay, so of course you can do other things. Uh, as I said, you can load the same file and you can start plotting uh, the estimate. So if you have a, a safe file, you can use that and you can use the command map plot uh, to start producing basically um, uh, uh, maps of the direct point estimates and of the uh, of the fake Heriot uh, po uh, point estimates uh, for the different areas. So this is a safe file of Austria and you can see you can map uh, the results uh, uh, in a map. But as I said, you know, you can use other software, more specialized GIS software effectively to, uh, to, to, to produce these maps, okay? So uh, this is effectively something that you can do on your own. And as I said, uh, this links uh, effectively to what I have already covered uh, yesterday. So uh, you can go through again the uh, the slides and you can see uh, now a bit a bit more clearly how how the fair model is using data uh, to uh, to produce estimates model based estimates of the target parameter of interest interest for the small areas of interest okay so all of this uh, that i just did in the last say half an hour or so 25 minutes is is basically what we covered here and the, the slides are, are just what uh, appears here. Um, and the other thing that we covered yesterday was an extension of the Fay-Herriot model to allow for correlated random effects uh, according to a model that is known in the literature as a simultaneous autoregressive model, the SAR model, that has a very particular uh, structure for the random effects, or seems a particular structure for the random effects, that depends now on uh, this correlation parameter rho that needs to be estimated and on this spatial weight matrix W, which in the simplest case, as we assumed yesterday, uh, we assume a spatial weight matrix uh, that assigns some weight uh, depending on how many neighbors each of the small areas, each of your municipalities in Colombia has okay and and uh, this comes in a raw standardized form so basically that's that that defines how uh, uh, different areas are, are associated uh, in a way uh, so this is uh, what we covered and as i said there is an example as well uh, in in the lab that will allow you to to fit that uh, fair Heriot model with specially correlated random effects and allows you to get an estimate of the mean squared error as well okay to continue here with uh, the, the transformations. So uh, I know that you have a particular, you may have a particular interest in terms of modeling proportions, okay? Uh, an example is say the proportion of households below a poverty line in small areas or in municipalities in Colombia, okay? Now, obviously what you can do is you can go ahead and model uh, the, the raw direct estimates uh, of the proportion. So you say I'm getting a direct estimate of the proportion, say that goes, uh, we have a proportion, the proportion may go say between 0 0.1 and 0 0.6 or whatever, uh, depending on how wealthy or not wealthy a, a municipality in Colombia it might be. And you can model directly this. However, because proportions are between 0 and 1, certain assumptions may not uh, may not hold. OK, so the normality assumptions, for example, the assumption uh, of constant variance and so on, some of these assumptions may not hold. OK, so in this case, uh, I'm going to present a very a, a bespoke solution that has been used in the literature, uh, especially when um, uh, when modeling proportions. And a popular transformation for proportions, uh, because I have a variance stabilizing kind of property, is to use the arc sinus transformation, arc sin transformation, and the square root arc sin transformation for proportions. Okay, so here uh, what we're going to see is we're going to specify a fair Heriot model, but the left hand side, which is the direct estimates of the proportions, are now transformed according to the arc sin transformation. OK, so you're not modeling directly the proportion, but you model a, um, a, a transformed direct estimates, the transformed direct estimates. Now, that's OK. Where the complication arises is when you take a back transformation to the original scale because you are still interested in 
predicting the proportion uh, of poor uh, households or households below the poverty threshold in each municipality. So you always have to apply a back transformation. So the technical, uh, the technical difficulty with taking a transformation is, uh, is finding an appropriate back transformation. And why is that difficult? Because in most cases, naively back transforming uh, to the original scale uh, may introduce bias. But uh, thanks to work by people in the literature, we, uh, there has been proposals about um, uh, back transformations that include the bias correction. So this is all done for you. And so it can be used uh, for back transforming back to the original scale uh, using some appropriate theory. The other, the other slight complication is remember that uh, the fake Heriot model requires the specifications of the variances of the direct estimates, right? But remember now that you're not modeling the direct estimates, but you're modeling a transformation of the direct estimates, okay? So that's the other complication, okay? So, but uh, this, all, uh, this has been solved, say for a transformation like the arc scene transformation or for the logarithmic transformation, there has been work uh, uh, by colleagues that have answered these questions, okay? So let's see a bit the specifications for the Feyerot model when you use an arc scene transformation, and we're going to see an application of that at the end of this session using data uh, from Bangladesh uh, to estimate poverty rates, okay? So under the arc scene transformation, one thing that you have to be a bit careful is that the uh, the variances of the direct estimates, you see the sampling variance, which is not by sigma squared EI, is now specified by this formula. It's one over four times the effective sample size in area I, okay? And the effective sample size, uh, this, this, this formula is obtained, and I'm not going to go through the um, algebra here, unless you are interested, I have, I have uh, the development back in my whiteboard. Uh, you use a, it, 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 in order to get that expression, you use a Taylor expansion of um, the arc scene uh, square root of the direct around the, the true value, uh, the square root of theta i, where theta i is the true value. If you, if you do a Taylor expansion and you uh, take the derivatives that are required and take the variances and so on, then you end up with this expression. Now let's focus on this expression here. What is this expression? It says that the variance, the sampling variances depend on the effective sample size in area I, in municipality I in the case of the of Dane. And how is this effective sample size calculated? The effective sample size is nothing more than taking the sample size in an area and dividing it by the design effect, okay? And the design effect, and Ansel explained what the design effect is. The design effect is the estimated design effect. Uh, so basically that tells you, uh, um, uh, and it gives you an inflation factor and in case say of cluster designs uh, and, and tells you effectively uh, how much, you know, what, how how much sample size you need in order to have the same uh, precision as if you were using a simple random sample okay so say if you had a design effect that is equal to two okay and you had a sample size equal to 100 dividing 100 by two gives you an effective sample size of 50 okay so um so the uh, you will see that uh by using this design effect, uh, the, this will allow account for possibly a complex sampling design. So that, that is a way of accounting for a possible sampling design. However, in order to do that, you will need to have estimated design effects uh, in, in, in the case, in your case. So you will have the, the organization, hopefully, uh, will have some access to design effects that then you can use in order to calculate this uh, NI, the effective sample size. And once you have the effective sample size, you can use that in order to calculate the uh, sampling errors effectively, okay? So um, once you have that, uh, then you are ready to, uh, to, to use the model. 
uh, uh, with the transformation. Uh, as I said, under the arc sign transformation uh, for the fair Heriot model, you need to use a back transformation. There are there is a naive back transformation available in the AMDI package, but there are also other um, other back transformations. It's another another back transformation solution that allows for a bias correction. Uh, the mean squared error is programmed, and uh, again here, uh, mean squared error is using parametric bootstrap or jackknife. And the implementation uh, is with, uh, as I said, with the EMDI package. Uh, the EMDI package will also allow you to use log transformations for the direct estimates. But as I said, uh, for proportions, the arc sin transformation has been proven to be quite effective. And uh, you can see a, a paper. There is a paper by uh, uh, Car uh, Carolina Casas Cortero and uh, and also uh, colleagues, including Partha Lahiri and so on. Uh, that is part of a book chapter, and and uh, and this will give you a nice application, uh, a nice application uh, of the arc sins transformation uh, in the case of poverty mapping uh, that has been applied uh, in Chile. So it's it's a it's another it's a country in South America. So it, you may have an interest in looking at what they did uh, in in their case. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's uh, move a bit forward. And uh, this this was the one extension I wanted to show, and we're going to cover that as part of uh, the lab and as part of an, an example uh, that I'm going to show you in a moment about uh, the the use of uh, the uh, transformations. The final thing I, I want to present here and give you a bit of a an overview very quickly uh, that might be helpful and useful for you is uh, an extension of the fair heritage model we, when we have covariate measurement error. So, so that means that our edges are measured now with error. OK, so. Conventionally. Under the fair heritage model. It is assumed that area, area level covariates are uh, that used in model fitting and prediction. Uh, the, uh, is, uh, the, the, the axes that you use are measured without error. And why is that? Because uh, normally you will get uh, your axes from a census or you will get your axes from other population level data. And uh, in that case, you assume that these axes are measured without error. OK, however, in reality, auxiliary information may be coming, say, from another survey, and hence it may be measured with error. OK, and uh, if that is the case, then there, there, is, there are reasons why you want to control for that error in your, uh, in your fair heritage model in order to be able to, um, to uh, have a more appropriate uh, estimation of the mean square error. So, uh, uh, also, remember that the census data may not be always available or may obviously may not be updated as frequently as you may wish to. So uh, uh, obtaining covariate information from other data sources that are more frequently updated uh, might be a preferred solution. But if that's the case, then you have to be a bit mindful of how uh, these covariates have been measured and whether there is anything, any error associated with them. Okay. So for the area level model, uh, if we want to account for measurement error, then you see that the uh, the estimated uh, uh, parameter of interest in area I, which we denote here by theta hat I, and we I am abbreviating that as a fair Heriot under the measurement under covariate measurement error. OK, is going to be again a convex combination between the direct estimates and the synthetic regression synthetic estimates. But now you see that I have used a hat on top of the XI to indicate that these XIs are measured with error. OK, so these are estimates, right? And and so we want to see how this gamma I will look like. Remember, the gamma I in the simple Fay-Heriot model, in the standard Fay-Heriot model, was uh, nothing more than the ratio of the between uh, area variability sigma squared u divided by sigma squared u plus sigma squared ei, which is basically the sampling error. Uh, in the case where x's are measured with error, the gamma i is slightly different, OK? Uh, at the bottom of this uh, slide, I'm giving you a reference. Uh, another important reference uh, is a paper by uh, Saron Law and uh, uh, Lydia Barra uh, that was published in Biometrica that exactly proposes 
the method for estimating uh, uh, the smaller estimation with auxiliary information that is measured with error. Okay, so let's look a bit at the gamma i to see what difference it makes. You see that now there is another component that is added in the numerator and also in the denominator. Remember that if I exclude this additional component that I highlight here, then I revert back to the standard fair Heriot model. However, now because I have my auxiliary information measured with error, there is this additional component that is added into the gamma, into the shrink x factor as it's called. Okay, so that uh, 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 minimizes the mean squared error among all linear combinations of the direct and synthetic estimators. And now in order to calculate that, you need to have a handle on how to estimate VI. VI is nothing more, okay, than a, a variance covariance matrix that captures again the, obviously the diagonal elements uh, will tell you the variances of the edges in each of the areas. OK, so you have to have a way of estimating the sampling variability of the axis, depending on uh, how this axis has been measured and what are the survey characteristics uh, of the survey that measured the covariate information. OK, so um, uh, so that will depend really on how your data has been uh, measured. Now, you may be in a situation where some covariates are measured with error without error, say you may have data from administrative data sources and you may have data uh, from other data sources that are measured with error. For those data sources that are measured without error, clearly the corresponding estimates of the VI will be equal to zero. But for all other sources that are measured with error, uh, then uh, the uh, entries of the VI matrix will be different from zero. And you have to have a way to estimate that. For example, if your axis were, say, uh, averages, uh, area averages or area proportions uh, that are measured via a survey, then you can use standard uh, survey estimation techniques in order to estimate the variances of those direct estimates. Okay, And once you have the variances, then you can plug them into the VI matrix and that will account for, uh, uh, for this uncertainty uh, in, in, in measuring the covariate information. So this is a bit of an attractive, uh, this offers an attractive approach for combining data from multiple sources. And I thought that uh, this might be uh, quite interesting for you because I know you have access to uh, administrative data sources and you may have access to other survey data sources. So potentially this might be a way to um, uh, combine, informa combine auxiliary information from multiple data sources. Uh, just a few comments on the Fay-Heriot model with covariance measurement error. Clearly, if your XI is measured imprecisely, then you're going to give more weight to the direct, okay? So be careful. Uh, ideally, you want to bring in information about the XIs, okay? Uh, but this information has to be measured somehow precisely. If, if your measure of the XI is imprecise, then this is not going to help you a lot. OK, because if you measure that imprecisely, then you will give more weight to the direct and you may end up basically the direct being a better estimator. In terms of uncertainty, in terms of uh, uh, the uncertainty compared to a model based estimator. OK, obviously, if XI is measured precisely, then you may expect to have gains in efficiency. And if XI is measured without error at all, then you revert back to the standard fair model. That's to be expected because all the entries of the VI matrix are equal to zero. Okay. MSC estimation in the Yabara Law paper, the 2008 paper, they proposed a exact knife estimator, which is another an alternative to a bootstrap estimator in order to calculate uh, the mean squared error estimates. And the implementation, again, the EMDI package has a particular function for allowing you to account for covariate measurement error, but uh, in order to do that, you will need to specify the VI matrix, okay? So you will need to uh, allow for the VI matrix to be specified, so you need to know how to measure the various entries of the VI matrix. Okay, so 
these are the two additional extensions I wanted to present on the uh, area level model. And what I will do now is I will slowly start going through uh, a case study. Uh, it's about poverty estimation in Bangladesh. And we, we have sent you the data. Uh, you have the data uh, for this particular exercise. So if uh, Angelica, I, I hope Angelica sent you the data, there was a uh, an R data file in those uh, in in that email, and that uh, effectively allows you to implement uh, uh, this case study uh, with the data I'm going to talk about. Uh, so in Bangladesh, uh, the uh, one of the ways uh, of measuring an asset, having an asset-based uh, measure of something that is correlated to poverty is basically uh, by creating an asset base, what they call wealth index. And this wealth index is being uh, calculated uh, using um, a principal component analysis. Uh, the data comes, comes from a, a survey called the Demographic and Health Survey, uh, the DHS data from 2014. And uh, uh, there is a standard methodology that is used with DHS data in order to uh, estimate an asset based wealth index. Uh, what we have done here in order to turn that into a more poverty mapping exercise, and this is not the point of this uh, case study, is not to be accurate. These are not official estimates in the country of Bangladesh, so you shouldn't consider them as, as official estimates. It's more uh, an approach to illustrate uh, some of the methods that we presented in this session. So what we have done is we have considered the quintiles of the wealth income distribution at some a national level, at the national level. And then we define the indicator of interest uh, to be the proportion of households that belong to the lowest quantile in its upasila. So the upasila is the target geography of interest. Think of the upasila like uh, it's, it's a much higher geography, but in your case, the equivalent will be the municipality. Okay, so in Bangladesh, Upasilas are admin three geographies and uh, is, is, is an interesting geography in that particular country. Okay, and uh, in, uh, in this case, 20% so of the households will satisfy uh, this definition at national level. So we define uh, that indicator at national level and that offers us a threshold. And by using that threshold, what we do is we then obtain Upasila specific estimates of the number of the proportion of households that fall, fell below the national line. OK, so and obviously there will be departures uh, between Upasilas. So different Upasilas will have different proportions and this, uh, these departures will reflect effect effectively disparities in the level of wealth across Upasilas. OK, so it's just a, a high, it's, it's, a, it's based on real data, but it's not a proper poverty mapping exercise, but it gives you an idea of how it will give you hopefully an idea of how area level models can be used to modeling uh, the proportion of uh, of households that are below some national uh, poverty threshold. So the, as I said, the data set that we use here, the, we need, remember that we need to uh, at least two set, uh, sources of data the, in order to implement uh, the area level model. We need survey data, uh, and as I said, this comes here from the Demographic and Health Survey in 2014. In your case, uh, your uh, survey data set, will, I suspect, will be, I assume it will be the high access survey. Uh, and, and in the case of the DHS, they have a stratified two states cluster design. Um, they use uh, we can and we, we can obtain from from this uh, from this survey direct estimates of the proportion of households in the lower quintile of the wealth income distribution uh, by using uh, in, in the different two pasillas. And we also obtain smooth variance estimates of the direct. So in this application, we have obtained, uh, we have used generalized uh, variance functions in order to smooth uh, the variances of the direct estimates. Um, now, remember that um, uh, Angela is, is, as I said, you know, is preparing uh, Computer Lab 1 and Computer Lab 1, I think that's my understanding, will be based on exactly the same data. So by going through Computer Lab 1, you will be able to see exactly some of the operations I'm discussing here. OK, what else do I need? I need auxiliary information. So the auxiliary data sources 
is what I call X in my model. So it's basically the X variables, the explanatory variables in my Faye Heriot model. And in this case, we haven't used any census data. All the auxiliary variables are coming from remote sensing covariates. Okay, so uh, we have data. We have a team here at the University of Southampton, like you have a team in Dane, who is able uh, to uh, process data at uh, low levels of spatial resolution. Uh, and then once these data uh, are processed from various data sources, then what is happening is this, uh, this data are aggregated up to the UPASILA level. Okay, so I suspect the same process for you will be to process the data at some low spatial resolution and then aggregate them up uh, at the municipality level. And the types of data that have been, been included, uh, just give you a few uh, examples of the types of variables that have been uh, included in this uh, particular exercise. We have uh, some uh, vegetation indexes, we have elevation variables, we have uh, accessibility variables, and also we have uh, variables uh, that uh, define the intensity of nighttime lights and so on. Okay. Uh, uh, and Jose. Are all the are all the are all the variables at the area level, or maybe they are mid set? Uh, levels like an intermediate level between national and and the Upatsala level. So for that particular for that particular exercise, uh, we have aggregated all the variables up to the Upasila level. Okay, so that's purely an area level model. However, uh, later on when we go to unit level models, I will point you to some papers. Uh, that uh, use uh, geospatial information on a much lower level, okay? Uh, especially when you don't have access to census microdata, uh, there has been some attempt to, to try and process uh, geospatial information at very low geographical levels to try and get as close as possible to potential census microdata, okay? And there are papers like that, so you can go a lot lower, okay? But in this example, everything is processed at the Pasilla level, okay? Okay, but but also are are cases are there cases where we have mid set level like, like we have region variables at the set are at the set time of area variables? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have you can have. I mean, here obviously we have to be a bit careful because here we are linking covariates to specific areas. Okay, so you have to be very careful how you link, especially if you have mixed variables and then and then uh, your classification your geographical aggregation the hierarchy is not um, uh, how can I, um, is not uh, um, it's not it's not hierarchical in some way so if 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 if, if areas cross classify then you have to be a bit careful okay you have to cut the data in ways that are appropriate that's why I'm a bit cautious about what I, what I'm saying here so if you are thinking of including additional variables uh, you have to link this at different levels, then you have to link that variable again to the areas of interest. OK, and this has to be done appropriately. OK, so when you start mixing levels there, you have to have a bit of a thinking about it. But yes, it is possible. OK, OK, okay. it is key to have the, the identifier, the, a good variable that identifies the, the hierarchical system of geographical aggregation. Exactly, absolutely. Okay. Otherwise, then you will start mixing things, and then that might become a bit complicated, right? So, uh, so it's very, it's very, it's a very good question, Jose. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, as I said, you will go through this, um, the direct. And the, the, the estimation of the point estimates, the direct point estimates, and the variance estimation is something that will link back to what Angela did, right? So there will be a practical session uh, that will link back to what Angela did. Okay. Uh, one thing I'm going to say when you when you see the, the sampling design uh, of this particular survey, the DHS survey, and I don't quite know how the survey in uh, in um, uh, in in Colombia looks like. But for example, with this survey, we had a, a, a number of upasillas that had only one one PSU, one one primary sampling unit, and obviously, 
uh, you know, estimating the variance there is not possible. So you have to do something that is, you're trying to impute effectively an estimated variance uh, using some design effect. That's the solution that we followed um, uh, as part of this exercise. OK, uh, and then you will see that uh, there, there are uh, for other areas, you, you will see that the estimated uh, variances are quite volatile. OK, so that's why we decided to use a generalized uh, variance function in this case. Uh, 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 and uh, effectively that. What the, general, the use of generalized variance functions does effectively it uses a model to predict the values of the estimated variances under that model, and then it replaces the direct estimates of the variances with a predicted or smooth uh, estimate of the variance. OK, so and you can you, you have a number of covariates that you can include there. You can include the direct estimates directly. You can include transformation of the direct estimates. You can include the number of clusters in a Nupacilla and so on as a potential predictors of uh, of the variances. What I want you to focus on a bit more is effectively two plots. Hopefully this can be viewed. Uh, the, the top plot here is basically plotting the unweighted and the, the weighted um, uh, point estimates. Uh, that's fine. It's just to, um, it, it, there's a quite, quite a big agreement between the two. OK, so you can see uh, what, what difference the inclusion of weights is making here, the survey weights. Uh, but the bottom plot is what I'm more interested in. On the left hand side, what you have is you have the uh, the, est the estimated variances, OK, by increasing sample size of Upasila. I hope this is correct. Let me just focus a bit more into the plot uh, for you to have a look at it. I'm sorry. Uh, let me just go a bit. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, a bit down here. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. So this is a uh, apology. So it's it's the 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 the, the x-axis here is the 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 proportion of the poorest uh, households in each supasilla, and then the uh, x-axis the y-axis is effectively the. Uh, let me just focus a bit more. Is the CV of the direct estimates. Okay, and you can see two things here. The, the red dots are basically these supercillas uh, that have one cluster, and these are quite smooth because the way we have calculated them is by using some kind of model to estimate the variance because you couldn't use the analytic formula for this. However, for the other upasillas, you see that there is quite a bit of an, uh, volatility in the estimates of the coefficients of variation, and what we have done there for this Upasillas, uh, we have applied uh, a generalized variance function, and you see what happens when you apply the generalized variance function on the second plot, the right hand side plot. You see that now all of these estimates of the CVs are quite smooth, they're nice and smooth. OK, and you can see they are smooth because these are predicted coefficients of variation under a model. OK, so you see what is the impact of using a, 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 a smoothing technique uh, for estimating the direct variances. OK, so um, this is something that you will cover a lot in more detail when you uh, when you um, uh, consider with Ansel at the computer lab on design based methods. And then we can revisit this example in order to, to see, to, to, to ask questions if you have any questions after you cover that, um, that, that session. OK, so um, uh, we have uh, a few more details about this particular exercise because I think that will be closer to what you might try to do with area level models with, in, with, DANE, with data from DANE. Um, we have direct estimates, but we are, we have uh, we, we don't have estimates for 157 out of some upasillas, right? So out of the entire uh, population of upasillas, in our DHS data, in the survey data, we don't have any data for 157 uh, upasillas. In total, there are about 500 and uh, something upasillas, and out of these upasillas, we are uh, missing 157. Uh, we are using auxiliary information that comes from remote sensing. Okay, 
One of the advantages and why people are quite keen on using remote sensing, obviously, is because the information is updated quite frequently or very frequently. OK, uh, in this case, we use a Fay Heriot model to model direct estimates of the proportion of uh, households in each supercilia that are below a, po a threshold that has been defined at the national level. Uh, we use a model selection in EMDI using the step command to select a, a set of remote sensing covariates. And the other thing that we use is we use a, a, a square root arc sign transformation for the direct estimates of the proportions. And what I'm going to present you to now, I'm going to present you estimates uh, uh, of the model that uses the transformed direct estimates and also estimates of the model that uses the untransformed uh, estimates, the direct estimates as they have been calculated, and we're going to compare the two, the, the two sets of results. Okay, so uh, this is an example of how you can fit this model using KMDI. What do you need to do? You still use function FH here, so it's the same function as the one that I used in my uh, previous examples. Okay, so nothing new here. OK. What I'm going to do, I'm going to save the results into an object called Faye Heriot Arxin Final. OK, again, what comes on the left hand side, you decide what name to give it, but give it some in informative name. Uh, the, the fixed part of the model says I want to model my poorest, my estimates of the poorest households in Ixopacilla, the direct estimates, not the transformed, uh, uh, not the transformed in this case. Oh no, this is the, the, the this is um, uh, this is the transformed model, I apologize. I'm using the poorest estimates, the estimates of the poorest households in Ixopacilla, and I want to model them as a set of covariates, okay? And I've gone through the model selection process and I have, uh, included here a set of covariates. You see there are uh, uh, zonal statistics here, as we call them. So that's the sum of a variable, that's the mean of a variable, that's the minimum of variable, and so on. So you have different zonal statistics um, um, uh, that have been calculated using the remote sensing data. Uh, we specify the variances of the direct, we specified the name of the data set, the combined data set, as before. The identifier of the area is called Upasila because here we are interested in Upasila's, uh, Upasila code. Uh, this is, these are the areas of interest. And now we are informing uh, R that we want to use a, a transformation. And the transformation we want to use is the ArcSyn transformation. And we also inform one, one, when you use the uh, transformation argument, then you also have to inform R what is your preferred method of back transforming to the original scale. And here we want to use this method called BC. We want to use the bias corrected back transformation. And remember, you have you need something else here. Because we use the arc sin transformation, we have to also specify the effective sample size. Okay, remember the effective sample size is needed because under the arc sin transformation, the variances of the sum of the directs are a function of the effective sample size. So R needs to know the effective sample size in each supercilla in order to be able to calculate uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, sampling variance of the direct. And in order to do that, in addition to the original sample sizes that you have, uh, you also need the design, the estimated design effects, and that's something that you can do in-house in DANE. Okay, so uh, uh, and the final thing, uh, you you can specify that you want to get estimates of the mean squared error, and in this case, as I mentioned, uh, the standard way of doing uh, mean squared error estimation is by using bootstraps a bootstrap approach and B, I have set it equal to 50 because I didn't want in this illustrative example uh, the uh, the code to take very long to run. But clearly when you do your estimations, uh, you can specify a much larger 
uh, number of bootstraps, as I, as I mentioned, about 500, or if you wish to, to, to see what difference the number of bootstraps is doing to your results, then you can increase it and see the effect. Okay, so here we're using a, a transformation for the direct. This is the square root arc sin transformation. And here are my results. Okay, so I'm using the compare plot command to compare the direct and the model based. And it seems like the direct and the model based are quite close. Right. Uh, this is a comparison of uh, the um, uh, uh, the uh, the CVs of the the mean squared errors. I apologize. The the, the model based mean squared error and the direct variances. Okay. And you see that the median uh, of the model MSC is lower than the uh, the median of the variance. Right. Be careful here because the model based estimates include estimates for an additional 157 municipalities. Right? We have 157 municipalities where we have observed no data, and as a result, for these 157 municipalities, we are not have direct estimates, but for these 157 municipalities, we have model based estimates by using the synthetic estimator. OK, so be careful that these plots are not always directly comparable because you have an additional uh, large number of areas uh, that uh, are um, uh, where synthetic estimation has happened and we have estimates for these out of sample areas, whereas for the direct estimates, we don't have estimates, direct estimates of these uh, out of sample areas. OK, just to uh, uh, to remind you, because I think this is quite important, uh, that um, prediction for out of sample areas, uh, we're using here the synthetic estimator. So you see that the synthetic estimator is nothing more than taking the covariates for area I and then multiplying that by an estimated regression coefficient, and that will give you the synthetic estimate for an out of sample area. You see for that out of sample area, we don't have an estimated random effect because the estimated random effect, if I go a bit back so that we remember what exactly happens, the estimated random effect is this one here. It's basically gamma i times the difference between the direct estimate and the regression synthetic estimate, okay? So you see that because we don't have a, a direct estimate, then you don't have a random effect. You cannot estimate a random effect for out of sample areas. The only thing that you have is this bit here, this part, and this is the synthetic estimator that we use in the case of prediction for out of sample areas, okay? So this is as a reminder, uh, because that's quite important, because in your examples, I think, uh, you will have out of sample areas, and it's important to remember that this is uh, this is part of any real data application with small area estimation. Okay, so um, and I have also outputted here some uh, residual diagnostics to see how uh, how the residual diagnostics look like. Now, these these are the results from the transformed model. Uh, and here is a comparison between, on the left hand side is the, 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 the estimates that we obtain with under the transformation. On the right hand side are the estimates that we obtain under the um, uh, model that uses directly the raw, the untransformed direct estimates. Okay. And you can see the first thing you see that is that the, there is a bit more divergence uh, uh, when we consider the model uh, between the uh, untransformed model uh, and the direct estimate. So you see that the two lines, the light blue line and the dark blue line, diverge a bit more in the case of the untransformed model, whereas in the case of the transformed model, these two, the, the estimates are a bit more consistent. They are more, they are a lot closer together. That's the first thing. The second thing I want you to notice is basically in these summaries below. The first summary gives you the summary of the estimated point estimates of the of the point estimates under the fake heritage model that uses no transformation. The second line gives you 
the estimates, uh, uh, the point estimates under the Fay Heriot model that uses the arcs in root square transformation. And if you look at the interquartile range, so between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, they're broadly agreeing. There are small differences, but they broadly agree. However, you see what happens with the Antrans, the model that uh, uh, doesn't use a transformation. You may end up with a situation where you get negative estimates. OK, and negative estimates of proportions are not are not acceptable. Right. And that's purely because uh, the Antrans form model does not recognize that you're modeling the proportion effectively. Right. Whereas the arc sin transformation has this additional advantage that it, it constrains uh, your uh, estimates, your model based estimates to be between zero and one. So you see that the minimum in this case is very close to zero, uh, whereas uh, the minimum uh, in the case of the uh, untransformed model is is a negative value. And 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 so uh, that is a bit of a problem. OK, so that's just a, uh, a just some some additional um, information that you may want to think uh, when you model proportions, for example, uh, it's likely unless unless the proportion you model is very specific and it ranges between certain values, uh, uh, it, it's likely that uh, a transformation may be required, uh, may be required um, uh, for, for modeling the proportions. This very much is the same story as uh, the, the debate between, for example, when you model a binary variable, Right. Uh, uh, traditionally, in the past, uh, people were using what they call a linear probability model, uh, ignoring the fact that uh, this is a proportion uh, or this is a, a binary variable, whereas then uh, modern and, and current practice and so on uses generalized linear models to do that. For example, you use a logistic model to model a binary variable. Um, and, and so this exactly is, is a similar debate, uh, but uh, uh, is, 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 you know, here, here is basically illustrating that the use of transformations, uh, especially when you model proportions as opposed to means, for example, uh, might be uh, requiring some further thought. But again, software is available for you to enable you to, to go through the estimation process without um, a big problem.